Hey everyone, it's Sevi. I'm super excited that we actually get a 5-star version of our free 4-star buddy Dan Hung in the form of Imaginary Destruction Unit Imbibitor Lune. Aside from being more fashionable, Imbibitor Lune comes with incredible power fitting of his High Elder status. This guide will discuss how to maximize that massive damage by covering his kit and traces, gameplay tips, idolins, best relic builds, light cones, and team synergies. Let's get into it! Let's first talk about Imbibitor Lene's kit, traces, and gameplay tips that compose his unique destruction playstyle. He's a 5-star destruction character who's all about dishing out a lot of damage in both single and multi-target scenarios, which is enabled by his innate means of increasing his own damage starting with his skill. Pressing Imbibitor's skill prepares him to consume a skill point, which can be stacked up to 3 times, corresponding to 3 levels of his enhanced basic attack. Each level has increasing damage multipliers, number of hits, energy generation, and toughness reduction. The level 2 and level 3 versions add adjacent enemy hits as well towards the end of the attack. Furthermore, he gets a crit damage bonus per hit that can stack up to 4 times lasting until the end of his turn. But this crit damage buff only starts stacking at the 4th hit of either his level 2 or 3 basic attack. Increasing the skill trace level will increase the crit damage bonus provided. A fully enhanced basic attack gives the best value for skill point usage and when combined with different damage related buffs will let Imbibitor output insane damage. However, this also makes his playstyle very skill point hungry as he can easily burn through your team's SP if you consistently use his high level enhanced attacks. This is a challenge to utilizing him effectively as you will need good SP management and team rotations to feed the dragon and unleash his true potential. We'll discuss more tips regarding these aspects as we go along. To help offset Imbibitor's SP usage, his ultimate deals AoE damage while also giving him two Squama Sacrosancta charges. These are replacements for Imbibitor to consume rather than using skill points, giving you the opportunity to recoup your team's skill points when he has those charges. However, his ultimate has a 140 energy cost, which is quite high. Depending on your teammates and the combat scenario, that can take a while to fully recharge. So for the most part, Imbibitor still has to rely more on the skill points his teammates provide him, which is why good team SB management is essential. One small tip you can do is to link his ultimate right after using a level 2 or 3 attack. This is so that his ultimate, which is an action inserted before his turn technically ends, also benefits from the crit damage and pre-stacked damage bonus buffs provided by his enhanced basic attack. However, if his ultimate is ready, you can opt to use it first to not waste energy and you can immediately use his squama stacks to save skill points. Moving on, his talent boosts Imbibitor's damage even further since he gets one damage boost stack called Righteous Heart after each hit of his basic or ultimate attack stacking up to 6 stacks and lasting until the end of his turn. Then Imbibitor's technique makes him enter the Leaping Dragon state where pressing his attack makes him rapidly move forward, blocking enemy attacks and initiating combat. If he starts combat this way, he deals damage to enemies and instantly gains one Squama Sacrosancta charge at the start of battle. Let's take a quick look at his Ascension bonus abilities and stat bonus traces too. The Ascension 2 ability regenerates 15 energy at the start of battle to help him charge his ult sooner. The Ascension 4 ability increases his CC debuff resistance by 35%, helpful for preventing those annoying disabling or slowing effects that can especially affect your rotation. And the Ascension 6 ability gives a 24% crit damage bonus when attacking imaginary weak enemies, another damage boosting buff that just helps him deal even more crazy amounts of damage. As for his minor stat bonuses, he gets HP, crit rate, and imaginary damage boost. When leveling up his traces, his basic attack level multipliers compose a massive portion of his damage, so prioritize that above all else if you still have to be efficient with materials. Now let's talk about some general gameplay considerations on using Imbibitor's enhanced basic attacks and adapting his combos in less than ideal scenarios. If you want as much AoE damage as possible, you of course want to consistently use his level 3 basic attack. As such, you'll need to have teammates that are mostly SP positive, meaning they're not too dependent on their skill abilities and can use basic attacks often to keep generating skill points. They should also be quite fast and oftentimes they will want to be faster than Imbibitor for better turn frequency that lets them cycle through their abilities and more importantly generate skill points faster. Being familiar with your team dynamics and planning ahead will help you refine your rotation on him to know how to achieve maximum attacks more consistently. While this is ideal and attainable with the right supports and builds, it's perfectly fine and expected that in some situations, using his level 3 attack isn't doable if your rotation wasn't ideal or perhaps if you urgently need to allocate a skill point to someone else's ability. In such cases, it's okay to pass a level 3 attack and just focus on setting up a 
strong level 3 attack for the next turn. But if during this turn, you can still afford Imbibitor 1 or 2 skill points to front load some damage without compromising ally abilities that need to be applied immediately after, then you can definitely do so. But again, prioritize setting up to get that strong level 3 attack, even if this leads you to an alternate between unenhanced or low enhanced attacks. In summary, you really want to use his level 3 attacks as often as possible, which is possible with a good team setup. If during his turn you're running short on SPs, save what you need to set up a strong level 3 attack next turn. Next, let's talk about charging up that costly 140 energy ult. Knowing how to charge it as efficiently as possible can help you keep track of how often you can expect to get Squama points to feed this dragon. Using his enhanced basics regenerates more energy than usual, but without extra ERR or energy sources, he's short of a 3 turn ult. So either he does a 4 turn ultimate rotation or have an extra energy source like killing an enemy or getting hit. Getting his signature light cone grants exactly enough ERR to bring that down to 3 turns. But that costs Stellar Jades, so another way to guarantee a 3 turn ult is via Tingyun and her battery ult. And if you have both, you could potentially get his ult ready in 2 turns. These shorter ult rotations assume you have his level 3 attacks each turn though, so it could take longer if you're alternating his level 3 attacks. If you're that concerned, you can calculate his energy generation with specific conditions to know how fast he can recharge his ultimate in those scenarios. Now that we've examined his base E0 kit, I'm happy to say that without his idolance, he still hits for huge amounts of damage. But let's take a quick look at what they can provide. E1 lets his Righteous Heart now stack up to 10 times, and every hit will give 2 stacks rather than 1. This equates to his damage boost ramping faster and having a higher ceiling. E2 is a significant early idolan, as his ultimate now has a 100% advance forward effect after casting, similar to how Sushang works. It also adds an extra Squama charge, totaling to 3 Squama charge is generated rather than two. With this, he can now chain a level 3 attack, then ultimate, followed by another level 3 attack that won't use skill points. This results in a huge bump in damage, and it incentivizes using attack boots more since he can focus more on just making that combo hit harder than moving faster. If you're a simp willing to dump your jades on him, then E2 is the best value idolin for a significant bump in damage. E3 increases his skill and basic attack levels. E4 makes his skill crit damage buff now last until the end of his next turn. This now makes the buff have more or even nearly full uptime depending on your rotation, which lets it already affect the first 3 hits of his next enhanced basic attack. E5 increases his ultimate and talent levels, and lastly, E6 gives him yet another massive damage boost. When any other ally uses their ultimate, Imbibitor's next level 3 basic attack gets a 20% imaginary resistance penetration, which can stack up to 3 times. Resistance penetration buffs are quite rare, and with the way it factors in damage calculations, it has a huge impact impact and amplifying damage. Moving on, let's cover his relic build, starting with his stat preferences. For his body piece, you want crit rate or crit damage depending what gets you a good crit ratio. Take note of his innate crit buffs and any relic set effects when totaling your crit value. For the feet piece, there are cases for using either attack or speed. Going for attack is slower, which can cause the enemy to take more turns before Imbibitor does, his teammates to potentially overlap him, and having less turns in MOC cycles. However, attack still has beneficial trade-offs with Danhong's playstyle. If your other supports are much faster, they can quickly cycle their turns and generate SPs before Imbibitor's turn to secure the SPs needed for his level 3 attack. And despite being slower, he does hit harder when he takes his turn. His slow innate speed can also be compensated by external speed or advanced forward buffs as well, like a fast Bronya. Having his E2 gives a good incentive with using attack boots too. Ideally, you'd still have enough speed substats so he won't be too slow. 121 speed is a good baseline goal for MOC cycles, which you can achieve by using the 4-piece Musketeer, 2 piece hacker space and or having really good substats. But don't worry, I've ran him much lower than that and found that he can hit very, very hard anyway, so the difference isn't that big. On the other hand, more speed allows him to keep up with teammates, helps prevent enemies from overlapping him, and increases his turn frequency in MOC cycles, which you can adapt his rotation for. With the right team setup and SP management, it's possible to still have him do enhanced basic attacks in most of his turns. At the end of the day, it's best to have both pieces so you can switch them around and adapt which works best in the given scenario. Scenario. Then for the planar sphere, you can go for either imaginary damage boost or attack. While imaginary damage boost is generally better, the gap versus attack can be very close depending on the damage boost and attack buffs Imbibitor receives in battle. Substat quality also matters a lot. 
Then for his link rope, use an attack main stat. As for substats, get the speed needed to help hit your desired speed breakpoint. But if that's not a concern, then simply prioritize crit and attack rolls. Some effect resistance is also fine if you want more debuff resistance. As for Imbibitor's relic sets, he has two competitive four-piece options. There's the four-piece musketeer, which gives a permanent attack, speed, and a basic attack damage boost, all of which Imbibitor will make use of. Unlike his second option, the Musketeer has no conditions required, making it a very consistent choice. And it may be more efficient to farm its cavern since the Musketeer is a very flexible set for many other units and the healing pieces can go to your abundance units. Alternatively, the four-piece Wastelander gives imaginary damage and pretty high crit bonuses. However, its high potential is conditional depending on the enemy's statuses. For the crit rate bonus, you need to attack enemies that are debuffed. But the more conditional bonus is crit damage, which requires attacking enemies with the imprisonment debuff. This can only be inflicted by an imaginary break or welt. Farming the cavern might also be inefficient for you if you have no use for the fire set. Personally, I would recommend the musketeer set for its overall unconditional mechanics, but at the end of the day, you might have different farming efficiency preferences, so it's ultimately up to you. But as usual, two-piece combos of Wastelander, Attack, or Speed are still very good combinations, and you have more flexibility to combine better quality pieces. And for the planar set, the Rutilant Arena followed by Space Ceiling Station are his best options. The Rutilant Arena is generally better, though keep in mind that its crit rate requirement is fairly high to unlock its basic attack damage boost. It only counts the crit rate that appears on the stat page. Getting the right stat and good substat quality is also a huge consideration. You could also base your choice if you'd rather farm the Broken Keel set or the Fleet of the Ageless, which are paired with them respectively. As for Imbibitor's Light Cones, let's start with his two very highly recommended options. Brighter Than the Sun is his clear best in slot, with crit rate and attack bonuses, and even an ERR bonus to help with his ultimate recharge. These are all clearly advantageous for his kit, and in general, just a great universal destruction light cone. However, there are more accessible options with very close performance, so you don't have to feel like you're missing out too much without this. The Fall of an Eon is the next highly recommended, and best of all, free 5-star option you can purchase and superimpose from her to store. It gives high base attacks, stackable attack buffs, and a damage bonus after breaking an enemy. At S5, it's generally his next best option, just very close behind his signature light cone's performance. Another competitive, although more conditional option is under the blue sky with high superimpositions. Aside from attack, it gives a fairly high crit rate buff that lasts for three turns whenever he defeats an enemy. Of course, this means you want to consistently trigger this to achieve its true potential, which might be inconsistent depending on various combat scenarios. But but with ideal uptime, it has very similar potential with the fall of a neon. As for his other options, something irreplaceable, the standard 5-star light cone, starts falling on the rankings compared to the previous options, even behind an S5 fall of an eon. Though of course, it'll still be a very good choice. It also heals the user when they get hit, which does help a bit more for survivability. A secret vow and the moles welcome you at high superimpositions are still viable picks, though less ideal, especially since the eon already exists. All in all, since the fall of a neon is a very accessible top option, I recommend making it your default choice unless you're going for his signature light cone. Last but not least, let's discuss Imbibitor's team synergies and considerations, which is very important to let him achieve his maximum potential. First of all, we have some general criteria for optimal teammate choices. The biggest one, as I've emphasized many times, is that he wants allies who are effective SP generators. These are units that can largely rely on using their basic attacks, but it won't compromise their main function. Many supports are naturally SP positive, while some lean more towards being SP negative, but can still be tweaked for SP positive or at least SP neutral rotations. This also means they should be built quite fast to cycle through their turns quickly. If they're too slow, they can't generate SPs as frequently. And by their standard team template will be that of a hyper carry team, where there is a combination of two nihility and or harmony units, plus either an abundance or preservation unit for survival. Slotting in a second DPS may present more challenges depending on their skill dependence, as many DPS units do rely on their skills. So having Imbibitor and another DPS can cause you to struggle a lot with SP management. But as always, feel free to experiment. Anyway, let's first go through the considerations on Harmony units. Ting Yan will be a very highly recommended support thanks to her damage buffs, naturally SP positive playstyle, and most importantly, her battery utility. By recharging Imbibitor's energy cost, Ting Yan can reduce his ultimate rotation time by one turn every now and then. This leads to being a huge quality of life help with your team's SP management since Imbibitor can now more frequently use his Guama charges instead of actual SPs. 
I personally liked using her the most due to how good and convenient their synergy is. Asta is a solid free-to-play friendly pick with her attack and speed buffs, but you may want to use her in a more SP positive way. The trade-off is that her energy recharging time and breaking contribution is slowed down if she uses her skill less. You can at least compensate for her energy needs by equipping light cones that give her energy, and it'll be easier if you have her idolins too. You can also comp and babbit her with Branya to take advantage of her massive buffs, but take note, you'll want a fast-built Branya so she can be SP neutral or positive. You can visit my Branya guide to better understand how to speed tune her. If you have her E1 or signature light cone, that will also help in neutralizing her own SP consumption. But if you play her to alternate between her basic attacks and skill, and you don't have enough SP to do Imbibitor's level 3 attack every turn, then you can instead align his level 3 attack with Branya's skill buff to maximize its damage. Last among Harmony supports is Yukong, who has potent combined attack and crit buffs. However, you may want to adapt at least an SP neutral rotation where she alternates between her basic attack and skill buff. Due to how her buff durations work, she also needs to be speed tuned to take her turn before Imbibitor, which can be desynchronized if an enemy applies a CC debuff on either of them. If you'd prefer not to deal with those potential issues, then other Harmony units will be more convenient to use. Having her E6 will at least make her setups easier and she can also equip the planetary rendezvous light cone to give Imbibitor more imaginary damage bonus or for a mono imaginary team. Moving on to our Nihility options, Pela is a great option thanks to her SP positive playstyle. She can be almost entirely basic attack dependent since you only really need to use her skill for cleansing important buffs on enemies. Even then, she can achieve a 2-3 turn ult rotation depending on her equipment just by using basic attacks, thereby ensuring that her defense shred has very high or permanent uptime. Her defense shred is also AoE targeting, which will be very useful when up against multiple enemies and to buff Danhong's AoE damage. On the other hand, Silver Wolf also has very potent but single target focused debuffs. Being able to implant a weakness to reduce their elemental resistance and break them faster is clearly a valuable ability. This can make Imbibitor more effective against enemies who aren't innately weak to imaginary and she's a top unit for a mono imaginary team. She's also a good SP generator since she only needs to use her skill to refresh the weakness implant, then she can just do basic attacks until she needs to reapply the weakness. Another Nihility unit is Welt. His slowing debuffs can let your teammates get in more actions before the enemy's turn, and his ultimate can increase the damage enemies take. Welt is also the only imaginary unit who can apply the imprisonment effect with his ability rather than relying on breaking, which will help give the 4-piece Wastelanders crit damage bonus a more consistent uptime. However, Welt does need to use his skill every now and then to reapply the slow debuff, and if he takes on a more SP neutral or positive rotation by using basic attacks more often, that will also lower his damage potential and energy generation. As for your survival supports, all our current preservation and abundance units can do the job well, with their own pros and cons, so it'll mostly boil down to who your best built options are and if you're trying to counter enemy weaknesses. As a special mention, Luocha is of course fantastic with Imbibitor, as combining them can make faster work of breaking imaginary weak enemies on top of his very strong healing and buff manipulation utilities. It'll also be efficient to farm for both Imbibitor and Locha in the Musketeer and Passerby Relic Cavern, as Locha can make use of either set. Fushuan is also coming up if you plan to get her, and she should be a standard setting preservation character for solo sustaining, with a team-wide crit rate buff as well to boost everyone's damage. Lynx should also be a strong 4-star healer who provides healing and debuff cleansing utilities. Her special ability is increasing the aggro of destruction and preservation units, but with Imbibitor that that's not as advantageous compared to increasing Blade or Clara's aggro who have follow-up attack mechanics. And that's it for this Imbibitor Lene guide. It should be clear at this point that he requires some strategy and foresight with regards to team SP usage to sustain his SP heavy diet. Despite that, Imbibitor's incredible damage payoff is well worth it. But let me know in the comments what you think about Imbibitor Lene, whether you were able to try him out, or have gotten some impressions from seeing him in action. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already, and I will see you all soon. Take care!